Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out or staying on campus late uh, to join us this evening. Uh, my name is Charlie Reardon. I'm the, the provost here at Hofstra. And it's a real pleasure to uh, invite you to uh, welcome you to this evening's um, festivities. And I, I really do think it will be a festive occasion because it's an opportunity for the Hofstra community to, to celebrate um, all that is wonderful about our disciplines, the variety of our disciplines, the impact of our work to society, and um, all that we can learn from, from one another. So um, let me start by full disclosure that um, a couple of people have come up to me and said, this is really a wonderful idea. Even if you hadn't told me it was a wonderful idea, I would give you the full disclosure that um, this was a type of a program that started maybe 15 years ago at the University of Delaware, where many of you know I was on the faculty for 25 years. So um, I saw that good idea and decided that that good idea could move for, uh, north from Newark, Delaware to Hempstead, uh, New York. So I think it's really a, a great opportunity to hear from scholars here on our campus community who have, uh, at times, and you'll hear through tonight, really uncommon and unique perspectives on the Nobel Prizes and the no Nobel laureates uh, to varying degrees. And what I really love about this opportunity, again, is, is just the, the breath. And so we'll hear, um, just to let the speakers know if they're not all aware, we're going to proceed down in the order in which the, the prizes are listed on the, uh, on the advertisement. So we'll start with literature, go into economics, peace, medicine or physiology, chemistry, and then end with physics. Um, so just a, a couple of comments to frame this uh, a little bit in, in terms of um, Alfred Nobel and the, and the Nobel Prize. I mean, many people uh, I'm certainly are sure of aware that um, uh, Alfred Nobel uh, made his career by working on uh, a chemical, I'm a chemist, so full disclosure, nitroglycerin and developed dynamite um, and used dy dynamite um, in the late uh, 19th century for a whole variety of applications. And it's interesting, and I've only learned this in the last couple of days reading uh, to try to give you some new information with respect to the Nobel. You know, um, it's always been uh, communicated that um, the Peace Prize was very important to Alfred Nobel. and. Uh, the notion was, although it wasn't really necessarily clear, the direct connection that um, he wanted to take um, some of the resources that he, he gained by being a very uh, uh, successful, uh, if you will, uh, business person um, by developing dynamite and, and taking those rich and turning them for, for greater good and recognizing um, the arts, the sciences, and peace in particular. But I read something uh, recently that uh, probably won't be news to everyone in this room, but it was news uh, to me, is that they think there may be a, a clear linkage uh, to his commitment to peace, to his, the opportunity that came about by chance in which he um, had the opportunity that uh, few of us ever have, um, and I'll let you determine whether that's for good or for evil, to effectively read his own obituary. Um, and so what happened was about seven years before he died, his, uh, one of his brothers, Ludwig, died of a heart attack. And the French paper that was reporting on Ludwig's death got it wrong and thought they were reporting on Alfred's death. So reports of his death were greatly exaggerated um, in that context. But what was so noteworthy in that obituary, they described him, uh, among other terms, English translation, as the merchant of death because of all of the impact in the war effort and others of his discoveries, the dynamite that he developed. So um, you know, the, one of the legends or lore is that he took that uh, very much to heart and um, that helped to further inspire him to invest in these uh, these awards that now for over 100 years have, have borne his, his name. So uh, without any further ado, um, we're going to start where we should start, in my estimation, with literature. 
the spoken written word. Um, and so uh, Professor Labine Lucif, who's a professor of Romance Languages and Literature, is going to tell us about the 2022 um, Literature Prize and to let Constantine know in baseball parlance he's in the on-deck circle. Uh, we'll go to economics next, but please welcome Sabine. Oh, I just want to mention logistically, we are, uh, the way we're, this is going to work, well, after each presentation, we'll have time for maybe one or two questions um, and then move on to the next presentation. Since these presentations are being um, recorded, if you have a question to ask, and I hope you do, please use the microphone in the aisle at the appropriate time. And uh, let's hear about the Literature Prize. Okay. Well, uh, first, um, Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, I am very happy to be here for uh, three reasons. Uh, the first one is that um, the process of consecration uh, is uh, actually something that I uh, specialize in. I uh, work on reception studies and um, well, the Nobel Prize is uh, maybe the most famous um, prize. And uh, um, I think it's important to understand how value is formed um, when it is about culture. So that's my first reason. The second reason um, is that I am absolutely thrilled to uh, have an exchange because we usually do not know about the other fields and sometimes for me outside of peace and literature I don't necessarily know uh, why the other prizes were awarded and so I am curious. And third, I'm very happy because I teach Anierno every semester. So it's a natural thing for me to speak about her. All right, so um, I don't know if uh, um, hmm. all right, so um, everyone can see. Okay, so I'm going to, to try to, to be fast. It's uh, very difficult to fit uh, such um, an important number of books, uh, such a massive contribution to literature into 15 minutes. Um, so here you can see a few uh, photos of um, Annie Arnaud at different times of her life. Um, so she received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2002, and uh, the reason given by the Nobel Committee is uh, uh, that uh, it was awarded to her for the courage and clinical acuity with which she uncovers the roots, estrangements, and collective restraints of personal memory. So let's just keep this idea in a little corner um, because I will, uh, of course, go back to it. All right, so um, what was uh, Ernaud's initial uh, project? I'm not going to talk too much about her biography because you can find that you know, uh, information easily. Uh, I think I will just mention what is uh, relevant. So her initial project, as she put it herself, um, she said, j'écrirai pour venger ma race. I will write to avenge my people. Um, actually, um, you can notice that uh, Maras is not translated as my race because uh, the way the word is used here does not uh, mean anything about ethnicity. It's more about social class. And social class is something that's very important uh, to uh, Annie Ernaud. So, um, what is special about her? First, um, Annie Ernaud is uh, uh, what, um, she defines herself as a transfuse de classe, a class defector. So 
what is a transfuse de class? A transfuse de class is someone who is born in a social class and through education and experience enters another social class, in her case, a higher one. And that experience creates a tension with uh, the people of the original social class. Okay, so she, I put some quotes, I'm going to read some of them, but not all of them because it will be too long. Um, so she says, in writing, no choice is self-evident, but those who, as immigrants, no longer speak their parents' language, and those who, as class defectors, no longer have quite the same language, think and express themselves with other words, face additional hurdles. So then what she says is that um, you are influenced by what you read. You become a master of that language that sometimes is not a language that the people around you can understand. So what she says about the influence of, uh, for example, the language in literature that she finds in Flaubert, Proust, Virginia Woolf, she says, none of them, when I went back to writing, were of any help to me. I had to break with writing well and beautiful sentences, the very kind I taught my students to write, to root out, display, and understand the rift running through me. So this is extremely important to understand that because she is the daughter of lower middle class parents. They had a grocery store slash cafe bar in a little town in Normandy. And she was a good student. When she went to school, that created a tension with her parents. It was very difficult for her uh, to keep understanding them and for them to keep understanding her. And so she's always writing about that trauma and she never forgot where she's coming from. So um, that's one aspect. Then the other important fact is that Erno combines personal and collective experiences in her books. Um, so I'm not going to read the first um, uh, quote, I'm just going to uh, read the second one. Uh, she wrote, I believe that the violence and shame inherent in society can be found in the contempt a customer shows for a cashier or in the vagrant begging for money who is shunned by his peers. There is a, an attention to people who don't have a voice in Ernaud's work that is absolutely one of the reasons uh, why she got the Nobel Prize, in my opinion. Ernaud is also very known as a feminist writer. Um, she writes about class and gender. Uh, in the quote here that I'm not going to read, she talks about how her parents have a conception of what a young woman should do to be respectable that is definitely class marked. And that is something extremely difficult for her. And then she says, I'm going to read just um, the second part of the quote. Um, so she's arguing with her mother who says you should get married and the mother is horrified because she finds out that she's sleeping with her boyfriend, oh my God. So um, then she says, I do, not know, I do not yet know that while they're urging me to give up my freedom, his parents are playing a scenario that is just as traditional, but in reverse. So her parents are saying, you are giving yourself away, you need to get married. And his parents are saying, you have plenty of time, you have plenty of time before you settle down. Don't let her get her hooks into you. Men's freedom is very well looked after indeed. Okay. Um, 
she is known as a feminist writer also because of what she wrote and how she wrote about abortion and sexual abuse. About abortion, she actually spoke about abortion in her first book in 1974. The book uh, is translated in English as uh, Cleaned Out. Um, and um, I mean, she um, explained in that book how the trauma to the body is not the only trauma, but it's also a social class trauma because if you are stupid enough to get pregnant and need an abortion when it's illegal, it's because you are low on the social hierarchy. So the stigma is uh, multiplied, okay? Now, um, 26 years later, she wrote another book about her um, illegal abortion in a book entitled um, Happening, L'Evénement in French. And she writes, thousands of girls have climbed upstairs and knocked on a door answered by a woman who is a complete stranger to whom they are about to entrust their stomach and womb. And that woman, the only person who can rid them of their misfortune, would open the door in an apron and patterned slippers, clutching a dish towel and inquire, yes, miss, can I help you? I mean, I think they should read this in Congress, <laughs> actually. Um, so, okay. Uh, she um, also, in a more recent book, um, talked about um, the experience uh, that she had um, when she had sex for the first time. And I think that today in the US, you call that date rape. And uh, I mean, this is uh, also one of the important themes. Um, and she's writing about this in a way that is extremely interesting because she uses the third person and she writes in a way that is both graphic and distanced. So it's an interesting mix. Okay, so all of this brings us naturally to sexuality. And um, Erno is a woman who loves men. Uh, the book that I'm teaching every semester is called Simple Passion. And it is uh, uh, a book about uh, an affair. And uh, it's a first person narrative. And um, usually when you write a book about an affair, uh, what makes it compelling is the where, when, who, how, why, all of the circumstances, right? Here, you don't know anything. You just know that this guy's name is A, that he uh, is um, a diplomat from an Eastern European country, and what you know and what she wants to talk about is the part that no one wants to talk about when you have an affair or when you are obsessed with someone. She says, from September last year, I did nothing else but wait for a man, for him to call me and come around to my place. I had no future other than the telephone call fixing our next appointment. I would avoid using the vacuum cleaner or the hairdryer as they would have prevented me from hearing the sound of the telephone. So, um, this is not about is this moral or immoral, it's about what is. And if this is what she experienced and what she thinks a lot of people are experiencing, this is what she's writing about. And she says, it occurred to me that writing should also aim for that the impression conveyed by sexual intercourse, a feeling of anxiety and stupefaction, a suspension of moral judgment. Okay, how does she write? Uh, this is very important because we all know that in order to get a Nobel Prize of Literature, it's not enough to talk about interesting topics. Okay, so what she says herself in her acceptance speech is, Starting with my fourth book, I adopted a neutral, objective kind of writing, flat in the sense that it contained neither metaphors nor signs of emotion. The violence was no longer displayed. It came from the facts themselves and not the writing. So 
it seems like contradictory, but when I try to explain her writing to my students, I say that in a novel or in an autofiction about an affair, it's all of the details, all of the context that uh, make the reader identify, that make the reader get involved in the reading. Here, there is none of that. So when she writes, it's like, you know, if you imagine all the details being like the flesh on a bone, her writing, her way of writing is the bone without the flesh, okay? It's dry. You can tell that behind each sentence, there are weeks of work. It's extremely powerful. There is no difficult language. It's dense in the best uh, possible meaning of the word. So I want to go back. She said she wanted to avenge her people. So did she do that? So she says that she's not sure that she did it or not. Um, but what she says that's important is that it was from this promise and from her four beers, hardworking men and women inured to tasks that caused them to die early, that she received enough strength and anger to have the desire and ambition to give them a place in literature amid this ensemble of voices. So out of this, why did she get the Nobel Prize? I'm going back to the beginning, the reason given by the committee. For the courage and clinical acuity with which she uncovers the roots, estrangements, and collective restraints of personal memory. In other words, and I tried to cover that in my uh, fast presentation, she created a new form of writing that we could call auto-sociobiography. Auto-sociobiography. Number one, stylistic characteristics, short, focus, concise, economy of words, authorial, absence, presence, statements, suggestions, direct address to the reader, impersonal descriptions of events and material objects. The pain of form consisting in searching and tracking down the truthfulness of sensations and social context. Number two, writing's purpose, to legitimate the dominated class excluded from literature and confront taboos such as social um, shame. Number three, the combination of personal and collective experiences. In the years, one of her most recent uh, books, she draws on photos, historic events, consumer objects to create an impersonal autobiography. To Erno, writing means looking at consumer society, pacing the aisles of shopping malls and supermarkets, losing oneself in others' faces and bodies. So now my conclusion. Why did Ernaud receive the prize in uh, 2022? I would like to like, go back to a more like sociological approach uh, of literature. The exchange between a writer and their reader can be understood as a complex system of crossed anticipations. What I mean by that is that when someone is writing a book, they have a certain image of a writer that they're trying to reach. And when someone is speaking a book, uh, they have a certain idea of what the writer and the books are. When the crossed anticipations of a writer and their audience also intersects with globally relevant ideological debates, that author has a chance to win the Nobel Prize of Literature. Now my question is, would Annie Ernaud have won the Nobel Prize of Literature without the Me Too movement and without the reversal of Roe and Wade? I don't know, I don't think it would have been enough uh, for her to win it, but it certainly played a role. But let's not forget that Annie Ernaud's incisive, bone dry writing is what succeeded in elevating events of the personal sphere to that of the universal. And she wrote early on um, in her first book, maybe the true purpose of my life is for my body, my sensations, and my thoughts 
to become writing. In other words, something intelligible and universal, causing my existence to merge into the lives and heads of other people. That merging, I believe, got her the novel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabine. That was wonderful. Time for one question, if somebody has. You, actually, your last slide answered the question that I was going to ask about the context, because Alfred Nobel was always quick to point out that the, or what he was quick to point out, his intention in the award was that it would be for impactful work in the preceding year. So the context in which we live really influenced in her receiving it at this time. Yeah. Ah, uh, the Franco-American tension. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Way to kick us off. So now we're going to move to the, the newest of the prizes. So in, in 1901, there were five prizes that launched. Um, the sixth came around much later, 1968 and that's the prize in economics. And so Constantine Alexandrix, the associate professor in economics and chair of the department, will tell us about uh, last year's prize in economics. Slides, no slides? Uh, slides, yes. OK. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, I hope to make it worth your time. And the good news is that unlike my intermediate macro students, you won't have to take a test on the things that I will present today. So, um, so who are the people who won the Nobel Prize in economics? Uh, these are the names uh, and their affiliations, Deep Big Diamond and Bernanke. Uh, Bernanke, of course, after MIT, getting his PhD at MIT, went to Princeton and then was appointed to the Federal Reserve, where he served as chair during the um, financial crisis. Now, the public has known, so I should say that my goal here is to talk a little bit about the three papers that the committee cited uh, when they decided to award the award, the Nobel Prize to, uh, to those three, um, and help you understand a little bit about the importance of their work and why they received it. Uh, a common theme is bank runs, and the, the public has known about and feared bank runs for a long time. Um, in one of my favorite movies, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, a bank run makes the hero, George Bailey, wish that they had never been born. So, uh, But until Diamond and Dibwick, we didn't have a full understanding of why they happened. So in the 1983 paper, Diamond and Dibwick show that runs occur not because banks do something bad, but in fact because they do something good. They perform a very important function. That function is called maturity transformation. Uh, the term maturity... Uh, means the time between someone gives a loan until they get uh, paid back in, in full. Uh, so uh, Diamond and Divvik show that this maturity transformation is very important. It promotes social welfare, societal welfare, but makes it's, it is what makes banks vulnerable to runs. Uh, they also show that bank runs can occur as a result of rational behavior, depending on depositors' beliefs about um, what other people do. So therefore, if this function promotes social welfare, then policymakers would want to make sure to the extent possible that bank grants do not happen in order to allow uh, banks to perform this very important function, but more on that later. Now, I know that it's usually a bad idea 
to show numbers in, when presenting to a general audience, but I promise that this is a very simple example and it will help greatly to illustrate the point. Um, so I think I actually skipped one. There we go. So suppose that there were no banks, right? So if, let's say, we have a business that wants to borrow $40,000 to buy a forklift and they want to repay it in five years, how would they go about it? Well, let's say that somewhere there's a lender who has the money and is nearly certain that they will not need it for the five years, but there's still a 5% chance that they may because an emergency may arise. Now, if they give out the loan and they have to take it back early, then there is a penalty. So this risk imposes a cost to, uh, cost to society because if lenders make this loan, the loan, then those who have to withdraw early will incur the penalty. And if they decide not to give out the loan in order to avoid the risk, then businesses cannot obtain the funds they need in order to uh, finance their productive investments. So how do banks solve this problem? They do so by raising funds, uh, by collecting small amounts from many different people, many different depositors. So in this example, a bank could raise 43000 by collecting $430 from each of 100 different depositors. Now, if each depositor has a 5% chance that they might need that money early, then the bank knows that within those uh, five years, five out of those 100 depositors will show up early. But the beauty is that the bank does not need to know who those people are. They don't need to know who they are. Um, all that the bank needs to do is make sure that there's enough money there for those five people. This is, by the way, an application of the law of large numbers. So this means that they need to keep, in this example, a little over $2,000 there, but that still leaves them with $40,000 which they can lend out to the business. So this is great because the bank can address the depositor's concern. Uh, it tells them, look, you can withdraw your money anytime you want without having to wait, that's zero maturity, and still be able to make long-term loans, in this case, uh, a five-year loan. So this process is called maturity transformation, and it's very important because it facilitates credit. But this works only so long as only those who need to withdraw early do so. And that depends on what depositors believe other depositors will do. So if you think that only those who need will withdraw the money, then your best incentive is to just leave your money at the bank because it collects some interest there as opposed to putting it under your mattress. But if you worry that other people will go to withdraw early even when they don't need to, then your best strategy is to do the same because if you don't, then the money may not be there later on. And if enough people share that belief and they, they rush to the bank, then you have a bank run. And we, we have what we call in economics two equilibria, two outcomes. Uh, which outcome we end up with depends on people's beliefs. And there's no natural tendency for markets to keep us at the good equilibrium all the time. And that's where the government has a role to play to make sure that this is the case. Now, in a subsequent paper, Diamond highlighted another important function that banks play. So I don't know if anybody has ever applied for a business loan. Typically, what happens is that you need to submit to the bank a business plan. The bank reads the business plan. They assess uh, its probability of success. They decide whether to lend you the money, at what interest rate, and then they monitor to make sure that once you take the money out, you really spend it on the intended purpose as opposed to gambling it in a casino. Uh, but both the screening and monitoring process takes time, it's and it's costly. Um, and so what would happen if we had no banks? Then the firm would have to obtain uh, the loan from many different people, from many different lenders, and each lender would have to separately do that screening and monitoring. So we see that the cost would multiply, right? It would multiply according to how many lenders are involved, and if it comes too high, then maybe lenders decide that, hey, you know, it's not worth uh, incurring that cost uh, because the amount of the loan is not that high, 
and they may decide not to lend to the firm uh, in, to begin with. And so again, we have businesses who cannot obtain the necessary funds they need to finance productive um, investment. So banks solve this problem, they reduce the cost because they act as a delegated monitor on behalf of depositors. Now, that raises the question, well, don't depositors need to monitor the bank? And Diamond shows that this is not necessary if the bank in advance promises depositors a fixed return, as they do. Uh, but that creates a risk for the bank. What if the bank lends to the business and then the business doesn't do very well? How will they be able to keep their promise? And Diamond shows that they can keep the promise by making many different loans to many different businesses whose probability of success are independent. So in this case, you have some firms doing better than expected, other firms doing worse, but they average each other out, and so you can promise the average return to your depositors. Now in a different paper, but at around the same time, Bernanke also showed that banks uh, circumvent problems of direct financing. Direct financing meaning the borrower going directly to the lenders as opposed to going through a middle person, a middle institution. That's called financial intermediation and that's what banks do. So Bernanke says one of the problems is asymmetric information. So when you borrow money, obviously you know more than the lender how likely you are to pay it back. Um, another problem is limited commitment. So if you lend money to someone, you have very little uh, action that you can take to make them pay you back. You can't stop them from simply walking away from the loan unless um, you, know, you borrow from the kind of person that sends someone to break your kneecaps or something. <laughs> but for, for you know, most lenders, that's, that's not how they, they can secure the, the loan. Um, so people have an incentive to just walk away. Um, now, banks solve this problem in two ways. First of all, they establish long relationships with customers. They record their history and assess their credit history and their conduct, and based on that, they figure out how credit worthy they are. Um, that's not perfect, so they have another uh, method that they use, which is that they uh, charge for loans more than they pay the depositors, a higher interest rate. And they use that difference to cover the losses from those few bad borrowers who will end up not paying them back. That's called the risk premium. As far as limited commitment, they solve the problem by requiring collateral. So if you walk away, then the bank gets whatever asset you uh, pledged as collateral. That gives an incentive to borrowers not to walk away. And if they do, at least the uh, bank can seize the collateral, sell it, and recoup um, the money. Now, Bernanke argues that during recessions, three things happen. First of all, defaults increase. More people don't pay off their loans. That means that banks have to charge a higher interest rate, a higher premium, because there's more losses that they need to uh, cover. The second thing is that the assets that typically serve as collateral, for example, homes, lose value during a recession, and so uh, people cannot borrow as much. So in the first case, when interest rates go up, they don't want to borrow as much because it's more costly to borrow. If the value of their collateral goes down, then they can't even borrow as much. And third, many more banks fail during a recession, so small borrowers have fewer banks from which they can go, uh, borrow, and that means less access to uh, funds. So Bernanke identifies the banking sector as a mechanism that uh, amplifies and prolongs recession. So we have an economic downturn, a, de a decline in economic activity. That means people default on their loans, the value of assets of collateral falls, banks go out of business. That means that people can no longer borrow as much. So they cannot spend on consumption, they cannot spend in investment. That additionally uh, further reduces economic activity and it makes the recession more severe and, and longer. And in his paper, um, Bernanke provides evidence that during the Great Depression, the reduction on, on cre of credit afflicted particularly small businesses and individuals who cannot borrow directly by, let's say, issuing uh, bonds like many well-established corporations um, do, and he also finds, he provides statistical evidence that this decline in spending that resulted from the credit crunch 
played a big role in uh, prolonging the Great Depression and making it more severe. So what are the important policy implications of, of the work of, of uh, the three Nobel laureates? Well, first of all, if banks perform a very important function, they facilitate credit, uh, that means that they help channel idle savings to, product in, to productive investment opportunities by overcoming problems of direct finance, then it's important for the government to make sure that the banking sector operates smoothly in order to be able to uh, continue to perform that uh, function. Um, what does this mean practically? So Bernanke credits Roosevelt with uh, FDR um, with two things. The first is the FDIC, which ensures deposits, and the second one is, was a bank holiday. And Bernanke believes that this played an important role in ending financial panic, ending bank runs, and, and help us recover from the Great Depression if people believe that their deposits are secured by the FDIC, then they have no incentive to go and withdraw early. Um, also, it highlights the important role that central banks play as lenders of last resort. So, in fact, the Federal Reserve was founded in 1914 for exactly that reason, so that when commercial banks exhibit a bank run, then they can go to the Fed and borrow as much as they need uh, in order to fend, o fend off that uh, bank run and until the situation normalizes. Now, ironically, Bernanke finds that the Fed failed to perform that function during the Great Depression because they did not want to interfere in the, um, in the banking crisis. And uh, perhaps that's the reason why, under uh, Bernanke's uh, leadership, the Fed took unprecedented steps um, to prevent bank Failure. So first of all, uh, many of the banks that were facing bank runs or financial institutions were investment banks like Bear Stearns or insurance companies like AIG. Uh, because of their status, they did not have access to the Fed's lending facilities. So uh, Bernanke expanded the lending uh, role and uh, authority of the Fed to include non-bank financial um, institutions. And uh, he also, and when that failed and, or was not enough, and there was a danger that some of the banks, major banks, may actually go out of business and not be able to honor their depositors, um, the government stepped in by buying equity of those banks, injecting cash to allow them to remain open and continue to hand out loans and make sure that depositors did not lose their money. Um, and by the way, I should mention that the government actually made money on, on all those, those deals. It's important. Um, also, Diamond's uh, work, 1984 paper, uh, perhaps motivated the uh, repeal of regulation that prevented banks, prohibited banks, from making loans outside in, in multiple states. Uh, some regulation even forced them to have one branch. And the idea here is that if you only give loans in one town or one state, so let's say you live in a farming state, then all your loans will go to farmers. Well, in this case, the probability of success of your borrowers is not independent. So if there's a bad weather and all crops are destroyed, then all your borrowers are unable to pay you back. So the idea of allowing interstate banking is that banks can diversify by uh, making loans to a more diverge to more uh, businesses, right, to, more, to, to different businesses. Um, but so this, I think, was a, an example of a bad regulation that was repealed in the 80s and 90s, uh, perhaps as a result of Diamond's work. But it also highlights the importance of good regulation. So um, that's regulation that makes banks more resilient to crisis. So since the Great Recession uh, and the financial crisis, major banks are now uh, uh, mandated to undertake stress tests where the Fed visits those banks and uh, uh, they go through scenario of, of, of distress and they try to see if the banks can with, withstand the distress and meet their obligations to their creditors and continue to perform the functions and, and, and lend out uh, to people. Um, so I think this is very interesting because this is an example of research that had great application in the real world and especially during um, 
a time of crisis when, when it was needed, and, and I suspect that this is a big part of why the uh, Nobel Prize Committee decided to award uh, the prize to, to these three um, economists. So, thank you. Constantine, thank you so much. Time for a quick question, if anyone has one. Um, I think it is fascinating that having an academic leading the Federal Reserve actually paid pun intended dividends um, during the financial crisis. Unless they had an oracle, there was no way they could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and the right academic, I should say. Well, but absolutely, the right academic. So, so now we're going to move on to peace. And Linda Longmire, who's a professor of global studies and geography, is going to tell us about last year's Peace Prize. Slides or no slides? No slides. Perfect. Uh, like my colleagues, I'm delighted to be here to talk about something so important and elevated, particularly since my hot water heater burst this afternoon in my basement. So <laughs> to, to, uh, to not be mopping up water is a great delight and added delight about being here. In any case, I'm really um, so delighted and so grateful that our provost put together this program um, because it is so important. And can I just put in a plug for our Institute for Peace Studies, which we have here at Hofstra and a new program um, that's called Paths to Peace, a study abroad program. So if anyone is interested in peace, please do check those out. Um, but I wanted to, and I'm going to talk, of course, about the three awardees um, in a bit, but I wanted to just say a few other things generally about you know, how different in some respects the Peace Prize is, and yet at the same time so intimately connected. I'm so glad that you shared that example of, you know, going from being the merchant of death to, or so-called, to someone who was committed in such a profound way to peace. Um, and I'm especially, oh, thank you, Greater Light. Um, and if, if you indulge me, I wanted to just share, which I have with some of my colleagues, a short anecdote about personal story with my own modest encounter with Nobel greatness, because it did have an effect on my own life. Um, uh, in 1967, yes, I am that old, I went to college from North Dakota at age 17, ended up at UC San Diego, which some of you, particularly you scientists, will know is a is a distinguished science, um, science school. I wanted to be a scientist, um, and I got there and could hardly cross the street by myself at that stage, let's be honest. And I ended up in freshman chemistry class with Linus Pauling, who had also just arrived. And um, was this was quite a shock for me eventually. Initially, I had no idea who he was, I'll admit and didn't know much more about the Nobel Prize. But of course, you all know he had acquired a Nobel Prize in chemistry in the 50s. Um, and then, of course, in the 60s, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his extraordinary work as an activist, addressing important issues of human rights, civil rights, um, of course, social justice, nuclear disarmament, as well as, of course, the anti-war movement that was very, very important to this whole period of tumult. And, um, and quite modestly, it uh, changed, changed my life forever. Um, I changed my major um, and uh, wanted to major now in philosophy. I also had Herbert Marcuse for freshman humanities, so that probably had an impact as well. But in any case, um, what was so extraordinary about him was this stretch of his humanity. Here he was, a cutting edge scientist. Of course, I started taking vitamin C immediately. But um, he also then would reach so far out into the world and to address these urgent problems that were turning the world inside out, turning the United States inside out. So that was one of the things that was so powerful about him and for which I'm so grateful, even though it did, as I say, change my major. I dropped out of school for a couple of years and then came back. 
um, after doing some political work. But in any case, I think it illustrates some very important things about the uniqueness of the Peace Prize. Because, as everyone knows, this amazing work that scientists do, it's in labs, it's in offices that economists do, in our academic offices, the wonderful writing and literature that that authors do, which is in their studios or their venues or wherever. But the environment in which Peace Prize winners usually work is you know, war zones and jails, torture chambers. And, um, and certainly, that can be said about the prize winners we're going to talk about that I'm going to spend a few minutes on. Um, hopefully, they also spend some time at the negotiating table. But because the, the Peace Prize is so explicitly, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting over cold, explicitly addressed to these urgent problems in the world, it sometimes is rather controversial, as well as some of you know the, the Peace Prize that was awarded to Arafat, uh, Shimon Perez, and Rabin um, was controversial. It doesn't mean that there's, you know, there's also controversies, of course, with the Literature Prize. Sabine will remember, what was it, 2019, where um, I've forgotten the Austrian author's name, Peter Handke, I think it was, who was a denier of the Bosnian genocide and a supporter of the war criminal Slobodan Milosevic. So, you know, you, you have some controversies, too, about the, the politics. But, of course, the Peace Prize is addressing these urgent issues in the world. One of the things that, of course, characterizes all of the, the, the people, uh, the person and the organizations that I'm going to mention is their ability to speak truth to power, as does literature, and in a certain way, as does science, particularly today when it's so beleaguered by non-believers. But in any case, the Peace Prize is, is unique in, in the sense, I think, that it reaches so far out into the world that it involves a lot of diverse narratives about, about power and about politics, a lot of different ideological interpretations. But it's so important for that very reason. The, it's, it, you know, the world's a mess. I don't need, you don't need to... To, uh, to, to question any of that if you look out at our world today. And the, the, the Peace Prize attempts to, as I say, do several things. One is to reward and encourage and, and support and protect people who are doing that kind of speaking truth to power, empowering those who speak truth to power. So I want to then mention the three awardees who are um, profound examples of that, particularly in these times. The first is, as some of you may know, is the Belarusian human rights activist, Ailes, uh, Ailes Bialatsky, I think it's his name. It's a hard name to, for me to pronounce. In any case, he is um, he's someone who has actually was nominated five times before for his ongoing work addressing, um, addressing peace and human rights in Belarus. And um, he was one of the, he was the main founder and is kind of the face of a human rights organization called Vyasna, which means spring, and um, where they have done such a long-term, deep uh, range of, of activities supporting human rights, including, you know, uh, lawyers' fees, including basic needs for human rights activists. He was jailed in 2011, 2011, and uh, for uh, until 2014, uh, for some of the usual charges uh, that um, you know were uh, using funds to support you know, um, critics uh, of the regime, and that regime, as you probably know, I'm sure you saw pictures on the news, starting in about 2020, where there was this huge human rights movement, democracy move, pro-democracy movement, the authoritarian leader of Belarus was uh, Lukashenko, um, is still Lukashenko, um, an ally of President Putin in Russia. And there was this, again, massive upsurge of protest and um, an exciting moment, and except, of course, the predictable crackdown came. So he was once again then arrested in, um, <clears throat> sorry, in 2021 
and still remains in jail, uh, which you know, some of you may have seen the film about Navalny, you know, the, the human rights activist in, uh, in Russia. Um, similar here, you know, held in isolation and horrible conditions. But, um, but again, um, he is, you know, this courageous, um, the face of this movement and uh, is relentless and perseverant and even hopeful at times, apparently. That's the other thing that characterizes these Nobel Peace Prize winners. They are often hopeful, even joyful, despite the horrific challenges they face and the hor horrific punishments that they incur. In any case, by the way, the other thing that's interesting, um, Sabine, this is for you, is that he is, um, Ailes is, uh, you know, he was the Belarusian literature scholar. He had a PhD in literature. And so the power of the word and speaking truth to power through that word, there's this deep connection, I think, between particularly literature and um, the narratives of peace and speaking that, that, uh, that truth to power. In any case, um, so the trial, by the way, has been held without a trial. The trial has just begun, so look for it in the news. Maybe it's partially because of what's going on um, internationally and support for him, but again, that's why it's so important with political prisoners to, to, uh, to let them know that they're not alone, and that's one of the deep functions of the, of the Peace Prize, I think, is to, is to shine light on those, uh, on those hidden spaces. Um, additionally, uh, the, to the second Peace Prize went to uh, an organization, the latter two, or both organizations, again, looking at, at this sort of terrain, this landscape of repression and violation of human rights. But um, the second one is the Center for uh, Civil Liberties in Ukraine, obviously in the situation not only now, uh, which is so urgent, um, it's more important than ever to have human rights organizations. And uh, this one goes all the way back to 2007, which really began with a group of nine different countries in the region to try to support um, human rights in, in the sort of post-Soviet era. And um, it has monitored, um, gathered documents. You know, as we know, evidence is so important in, in looking at human rights violations. And so um, that has been the, the great task of this Center for Civil Liberties. Um, and then, of course, after the invasion of Ukraine by, by Russia, um, it's, uh, it's been intimately involved in documenting war crimes. This is so important if these war crimes eventually go to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. You need to have evidence. You need to document, horrible as it is, what's going on there. So a very worthy organization to receive the second Nobel Peace Prize. The third is also an organization which is uh, actually Russian. Um, and again, it goes back, um, goes back 30 years. And initially, its task was, its mission was to, um, to document what um, human rights crimes had been committed during, during the Soviet era. And um, but of course, um, but of course, this uh, was always going to be a mild threat to the Russian authorities, but became even more dramatically so, again with the with the invasion of Ukraine and the terrible crackdowns that are going on in uh, in Russia right now. And of course, um, one of the, the pretext for their criminal activity is is almost always, as you know. Um, they're foreign agents, or they're being influenced by foreign agents, and so again, they've had to uh, shut down and to close, but have moved to um, other countries and, and are still trying to maintain, um, and also to, to gather and protect these incredibly important records that they have gathered over the last 30 years. When this was announced um, in um, in Russia that they had been outlawed. Um, there were people who were brave enough to stand up in the audience and start chanting shame, 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 again, speaking truth to power in their own, in their own way. In any case, as you can see, as we know, speaking truth to power is dangerous business. Um, and one of the extraordinary things is to see the courage 
I love to quote uh, Eleanor Roosevelt always, where she said, it's not enough to talk about peace. You have to believe in it, this deep sense of belief. And not enough to believe in it, you have to work at it. And these people have worked and worked and worked relentlessly. I'm always uh, surprised, as I mentioned before, at how hopeful people can be in these situations. Um, I, part of it is, you know, solidarity. Part of it is knowing you're, you know, you're on the right path of history, I guess. Um, but the enormous uh, courage in the face of all of this is, uh, you know, this commitment to make the world a more just, a more beautiful, and, uh, and certainly a more peaceful place. The other quote I always love is, I think it's Antonio Gramsci who said, we have to think pessimistically but act optimistically. And these are people who do that. By pessimistically, he means critically, you know, facing the, re the, the, the cruel realities of oppression and violence. Um, and these are people who do that, right? They see the reality, they face the reality, they critique the reality, but they don't run away from it. They address it uh, optimistically, even joyfully, and uh, in, the, in the process make a better world for all of us. Finally, I will end with Arundhati Roy, who I love as an author, and it's again, I think, highlights some of the importance of narrative and literature. Um, and of course, you know, often people say, yeah, but you know, is, is another world even possible? Isn't, aren't we so entrenched in violence and oppression and everything else? Um, and I love her quote. She says, another world is not only possible, she's on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. And indeed, that's, that's the sound of these people who have won the Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you. Any questions that I can answer? Any questions? Thank you for connecting the Peace Prize to the others as well. I think that was so beautifully done. One hour done, one hour to go. Feel free to stand up and stretch if you'd, if you'd like, but we are certainly going to move on to the, the prize for medicine and physiology. So I'm pleased to introduce Robert Hill, who's an associate professor of science education in the Zucker School of, of Medicine here at Hofstra. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for being here tonight. And um, thanks to Dr. Reardon for organizing this symposium and inviting me to speak about the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, which in 2022 was awarded to Svante Pebo for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. And um, in just looking at this sentence, you can see there's kind of a contradiction of terms. There's genomes on the one hand, and the word extinct is in there as well. And until Pabo's research, um, everything that we knew about extinct organisms, including the skull he's holding here, our closest extinct relative, um, the Neanderthal, everything we knew about these animals um, was from fossils. And um, Pebo's research, which spanned several decades, um, bridged this gap and told us a lot about the DNA of Neanderthals and other ancient animals. And uh, in a way, in Pabo's own words, uh, told us what it is to be human. Now, Pablo grew up in Stockholm, which is a great place to be if you're going to go on to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> he was also uh, the son of a Nobel laureate. So uh, if you'll forgive another pun, uh, maybe it was in his DNA that he was going <laughs> to win it all along. <clears throat> um, he uh, was fascinated from an early age by all things ancient, uh, in particular the mummies of ancient Egypt. And um, he never let go of this passion. Even as he went to medical school and into a career in research, he was always thinking about the mummies of ancient Egypt. And in fact, when he was supposed to be working on his dissertation research, he was sneaking down the hall and taking pieces of the mummy to try and see if he could extract DNA from the mummy. People told him it couldn't be done. But in fact, in 1984, uh, he was able to prove that DNA is preserved in the cells of a mummy uh, several thousand years old. This was groundbreaking in itself. 
but he soon ran up against what I would call the twin-headed or the two-headed monster that plagues ancient DNA. <clears throat> um, when you're alive, DNA exists in kind of two compartments. Um, there's the nuclear DNA that contains most of the uh, genetic information of an organism. And then there is mitochondrial DNA, which contains much, much smaller package of information, but many, many copies of it. And the moment that an organism dies, um, that DNA is subject to chemical modifications and fragmentation. It breaks up into millions of pieces. Um, and it also has a chance to become contaminated with DNA from other organisms, like fungi, bacteria, or human beings who are touching it and leaving their own DNA on specimens like this. So to face this twin-headed monster um, head-on, uh, Pebo developed clean room technologies, the kinds that are used today in DNA labs all over the world. Um, things like face shields and gloves, sure, but also um, UV radiation to irradiate uh, the lab in between sessions. So you could ensure that only the, um, the DNA that you were supposed to be working on was the DNA that you're actually working on. He did manage to successfully um, get some of the DNA sequence of the mummy, um, although there were some problems with that, but we won't talk about that, and um, presented this research at Cold Spring Harbor Labs right here on Long Island in the late 1980s. And this was a very uh, opportune time for him to make this presentation because at the time there were two big developments coming up in the field of genetics research. Uh, the first was PCR, which you've probably all heard this acronym, but what does it mean? You had the rapid test or the PCR test, which is more reliable. PCR allows you to amplify an otherwise weak DNA signal. So this, this looked like gold to Pabo. Um, the other thing that was going on was that the Human Genome Project was just starting to ramp up. So a multinational effort to sequence the entire human genome was beginning. And Pebo thought, well, if we've got more reliable methods and we've got a Human Genome Project, why couldn't we have a Neanderthal genome project? Go a little bit older than the Egyptian mummy. Um, so he asked for and received permission to take a sample from the arm bone, the humerus, of a, uh, of a Neanderthal fossil. And not just, the own, not just any Neanderthal fossil, but the type specimen, the original Neanderthal specimen to which all other Neanderthal fossils are compared. So you can imagine the um, look on the museum curator's face when he said, you want to do what? with my one-of-a-kind humerus of the Neanderthal. Um, but Pebo made his case for science, and the payoff would be big if he could extract DNA from this specimen. Um, and so using the same methods and refinements thereof, uh, he was actually able to extract DNA from a Neanderthal fossil, 40,000 years old. Um, nothing like this had ever been done before. And when he compared the DNA, what he was able to get was the mitochondrial DNA, some of those little packets. Um, he compared it to human DNA, he found, not surprisingly, Neanderthals were closely related to humans, not as closely related as chimps, but also of interest was that these were in three kind of buckets. And so humans were humans, Neanderthals were Neanderthals, and never the two should meet. Um, but Pebo knew that he was working with just the mitochondrial DNA, and that didn't tell the entire story. Um, he was after bigger games, so to speak. He was after the nuclear genome. And this awaited the advent of um, techniques called high-throughput sequencing. Uh, it almost seems from this picture as the uh, technology got bigger and better, the fossils got scrappier and scrappier. But he was able to extract DNA, um, good DNA in his words, uh, that, that's, in, um, um, that, that's well preserved and complete in terms of its sequence, and uh, use high-throughput sequencing to generate essentially the Neanderthal genome. At first, he got about 55% of it. He got much closer later on. And so now he had in one hand the Neanderthal genome, in the other hand, data coming out of the Human Genome Project. He could ask questions like, how are Neanderthals related to present-day humans? Um, his initial findings were that people with European or Asian ancestry share significantly more genetic variants with Neanderthals than do people with African ancestry. And one to two percent of the DNA of people of European and Asian descent comes from Neanderthals. Now, the picture that this paints, or the story of human dispersal that this kind of upholds, is that around 70,000 years ago, um, anatomically modern humans, like you and me, left Africa and um, moved into the Middle East. They encountered Neanderthals there who had left Africa earlier in a separate wave of migration. Um, these populations intermixed, 
and that the offspring carried Neanderthal genes everywhere they went, notably into Europe, um, into Western Asia, and even into places where Neanderthal fossils uh, had never been found and we're pretty sure that the Neanderthals never were. So while the Neanderthals then died out around 40,000 years ago, um, their genes live on in, uh, in people in these parts of the world. Um, additional finds proved to be even more spectacular. Um, and again, the fossils are getting scrappier and scrappier. This is a location called Denisova Cave in Siberia. And I'm an anatomist, and I'd be hard-pressed to tell you what bone that is. Turns out it is the last little bit of the pinky of a pinky finger of a hand. Um, could be human, could be Neanderthal. Pebo didn't know. Um, so he took a sample of it, ground it up, and found exquisitely preserved DNA that was, had a very complete DNA sequence. Um, but that wasn't the most spectacular part about it. It was neither human nor Neanderthal. It was something completely different. And when he compared that mitochondrial DNA again, he found that this new human, which he called Denisova, uh, after the cave where it was found, was twice as different from humans as a Neanderthal was. So this was spectacular, not just because he found a new species of human, um, but because he found it with virtually no fossil evidence whatsoever. This is, this is a, a species defined on ancient DNA, um, and really showing how far this technology can go. So the picture is a little bit revised. Um, Homo sapiens, our species, left Africa, encountered Neanderthals in Europe, and brought 1 to 2 percent of Neanderthal DNA into Europe and West Asia, but also encountered populations of the Denisova humans. And uh, as much as 6 percent of DNA is now in um, people of Melanesia and um, Papua New Guinea in particular. So this is a neat little story about human dispersal around uh, these continents. What does it mean for us living in the present day? Well, it turns out that people with Neanderthal or Denisova genes report more pain, and they report it earlier in life. So it's a sad fact that you get more and more aches and pains as you grow older. So if you're 50 years old and you complain of pain in your joints, uh, if you had Neanderthal genes, you might be more likely to complain of that pain when you were 42. This is uh, self-reported pain. So um, it led Pebo to joke that uh, despite their their brutish reputation that maybe the Neanderthals were actually pretty wimpy. <laughs> That's okay though, you can just take some ibuprofen, right? Maybe not if you have Neanderthal genes. Because if you have these genes, you might metabolize ibuprofen and other drugs like warfarin a little bit differently. And what's a therapeutic dose for one person um, might be almost toxic for someone with these Neanderthal genes. People with these genes have a greater risk of premature birth but interestingly, they're less likely to suffer bleeding and miscarriage. And this is an example of uh, the double-edged sword of having these genes. Uh, it's protective in some cases, but maybe damaging in other cases. And in a similar vein, um, these folks have greater risk for severe COVID-19 symptoms. Um, this is um, obviously just published in the last couple of years. And, um, but they're less likely to become infected with HIV if exposed to it. Um, so if you were in the hospital with severe symptoms for the initial wave of the pandemic, you were twice as likely to die from those COVID-19 symptoms uh, if you had Neanderthal genes. So these are just some examples of the, um, of the impacts of Pebo's work, and we've really just scratched the surface with the, um, with the implications of it. Is there research into DNA going on at Hofstra? Absolutely. Is the next or is a future Nobel laureate uh, hard at work in Gittleson Hall right now? I sure hope so, because as a graduate of the biology program here in 97, um, I would love to see that, and I wouldn't be at all surprised. I learned everything I know about biology from um, my professors here, uh, people like Dr. Uh, Peter Daniel, Gene Kaplan, and uh, the late Bob Johnson. And so, um, so it's a great department. And somebody who's up upholding that tradition is Dr. Faith Wang. Um, Faith recently joined the department and um, works on DNA using the same techniques honed and perfected by PEBO um, with a different model organism, and that's corn. A little easier to get a hold of and um, probably, probably easier to work with, but Dr. Wang works on something called transposons, which are jumping genes that move around in the DNA sequence and cause all kinds of havoc that are the stuff of evolution, but they're also the stuff of, um, of disease. 
And Dr. Wang is teaching a course in bioinformatics that gives our students a firm grounding in these principles. Lastly, I have to say, um, if there were no fossils of the Neanderthals discovered, then Pebo would have had no DNA to sample in the first place. So paleontology research matters, big time. We have a pretty robust paleontology community here at Hofstra. Um, there's me in, in younger and more dirt-covered days. Um, discovering a dinosaur bone in uh, Western Mongolia, not too far, just the other side of the Altai Mountains from that Denisova cave, maybe a couple hundred miles from there. And also Dr. Brett Bennington, of course, chair of the Department of Geology, Environment, and Sustainability, uh, is a paleontologist. One recent project that Brett has been working on uh, is with a student uh, named William Hart, and Will, Will made an incredible discovery this year on the north shore of Long Island around Compset um, State Park. Uh, Will found the very first vertebrate fossil from the age of dinosaurs on Long Island. So we knew those rocks were there for a long time, but Will, a Hofstra student, was the first one to find that specimen. Um, so that's really exciting stuff. My fossils and Will's fossils are too old to extract DNA from and do Pebo's kind of research. Or are they? In 1984, they said it could never be done with the mummy. Then they said it could never be done with the um, Neanderthal. So one day we'll see what these fossils are able to tell us from the inside and the outside. Um, if you want to read more about this, I highly recommend Svante Pebo's own book. Uh, it's at the top here, Neanderthal Man. It is um, equal parts personal memoir and um, scientific methods paper. So if you want to hear from the man himself about Neanderthal Man, um, you can check that out. This QR code goes to the Smithsonian Institute, which lots of other books to read. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. Excuse me, didn't you stand that Neanderthals and the Denisova humans are like two different species? That's a good question, and, and it comes uh, down to what the definition of a species really is, and I think that's changing a lot. Um, there is evidence that Neanderthals are distinct from modern humans, anatomical evidence and gene evidence. There is evidence that Denisovans are different from all those groups as well, and there's evidence that all of the groups interbred. So the question of, of what makes a species is, um, is a good one. Um, that definition is really kind of uh, up for grabs and, and, and not really agreed upon. Um, some say that there is a, if there is a, um, if, if, if two organisms mate and produce offspring and that offspring is not fertile, then that's a species barrier. That's like a, um, a biologic barri barrier to reproduction. Um, so they but, are the same, therefore, because but, the offspring survived, as we may see. <laughs> so well, the, the offspring the survived, but, but can they reproduce? That's the question. If they produce sterile offspring, then, then they're potentially different no, but species. I mean, if there are still traces of it in modern human DNA, then it's survived, right? There's, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but, but if there are traces of Denisovan and Neanderthals in human DNA, then yeah, they, they live on in our genes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And a question. Okay. So we may have Nobel Prize probably in a couple of years. So one of the um, uh, Hofstra Medical School professor, Dr. Kevin Tracy, I heard secretly he was nominated for Nobel Prize like three, four years ago. So maybe with the, uh, the ele bioelectronics, he will eventually get Nobel Prize. And other question I have is um, the genes you're talking about, are they involved in the inflammation? So that's why there are, you know, people with those genes are more prone to COVID-19 and the pain. Yeah, so uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it, it, they seem to have a connection with, with inflammation. There's a, there's a common thread running through there, and that's, uh, that's certainly a current area of research. And uh, also excited to know about uh, Kevin Tracy's career trajectory and um, proud to be a, a consultant on a, a grant that's just a small part of that. Um, Dr. Nasrallah, my colleague who's sitting back here, is uh, also a co-PI on that grant, and it's about reconstructing the anatomy of the vagus and bioelectrics. Yeah, we're collaborators as well. Thank oh, you. Oh, wonderful. Yes, please. The last bit about uh, <clears throat> how, depending on how much Neanderthal DNA you have, 
mm, may make ibuprofen effective or not effective or toxic. So that, to me, implies that in the future, maybe it's happening now, I don't know, that um, uh, therapies and drugs should be customized by analyzing peop a person's DNA. Is that being done, or is that what's expected in the near future? It's, yeah, great question. Um, I, I don't know the extent to which it's being done, but it seems like it absolutely must be done. This is the um, yeah, this is the realm of personalized medicine, where you can you can tailor the treatment to the person who's receiving it and and get better health care from that. Yeah, I think the days of uh, just treating someone with a certain dose based on their body weight are becoming antiquated, like the Neanderthal. <laughs> great, Bob. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. What did I do with my notes now? Okay, so we are going to move to chemistry, I believe. Yes, chemistry. Yalang Sheng, who, Xing, who is an associate professor of chemistry, will tell us about that prize for 2022, which includes someone who's won the prize more than once. <laughs> Um, good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure here today to talk to you about the Nobel Prize and the Nobel Prize laureates in chemistry 2022. Um, last year, the Nobel Prize in chemistry was awarded to Professor Carolyn Pertozzi. Oh, I don't know why my slides like that. Um, but anyway, um, Professor Carolyn Pertozzi, um, Morten Maldal, and Barry Sharpless for their development for the clique chemistry and bio-orthogonal chemistry. So Nobel Prize um, in Chemistry 2022 was really about making difficult processes easier. In Sharpless and Maldau, um, they both have developed the foundation for clique chemistry in which both molecular um, coupling partners can snap together quickly and efficiently to make complex molecules. And Pertozzi has brought clique chemistry to a new dimension and started to using it in um, living organisms in developed bioorthogonal chemistry. So first, please allow me to walk you through the concept of clique chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry. So clique chemistry, as its name suggested, it's a way of two molecules snap together like Lego blocks to make complex molecules. And by the way, the name clique chemistry was suggested by Sharpless's wife, who was an English major, <laughs> a writer. Um, so in early 2000, Sharpless and Maldal, has, um, they both independently discovered that um, these two molecules, let me just show you. and Maldau discovered that these two are great coupling partners or clique partners in the presence of copper catalyst. So they discovered that copper ion can help to bring these two molecules together and make them couple quickly to make a structure called triazole. Um, useful functional group in chemistry and material science. So now using this technology, we can install molecular handles on the complex coupling partners. So we can install azi on one coupling partner and alkyl on the other uh, coupling partner and snap together to make new molecules. And prior to this technology, researchers do not have a way to quickly and precisely make new molecules under accessible conditions. And clique chemistry are very fast and easy to use. And, and they are 100% atom economic reactions. What does that mean? So all, that means all the atoms 
on the starting materials are 100% incorporated into the product without producing any byproduct. And clay chemistry can occur in the presence of oxygen and water, which is known as a cheap and um, environmentally friendly solvent and under room temperature. So in contrast, conventional reactions needs to be done in the um, inert atmosphere because many of them are sensitive to oxygen and lots of reactions require toxic solvents. And also a lot of reactions require elevated temperature. So clay chemistry is great. It, now it can allow us to make almost endless um, kinds of molecules in a very fast fashion. And those molecules include pharmaceuticals, materials, and functional molecules. And chemical biologists quickly realize that clay chemistry can be a um, um, great way to probe living organisms as clay chemistry produce no toxic byproducts, and they can happen very quickly. And Carolyn Perjosi was one of them. And starting from um, 1990s, Perjosi was looking for invention of new type of reactions which can be done in the most complex reaction vessels. So when we think about chemical reaction vessels, we usually run reactions in those round bottom flasks where you can control all the parameters, such as um, the reagents you're adding, the reaction temperature, right? However, if one's goal is to do chemistry in the life cells, right, the environment is very different. But there are a lot of problems you can solve by doing chemistries in this living um, life cells. For example, you can attach an image probe on the biomolecule and then to study the biological processes in their native environment. And their native environment, of course, has a lot, lot of complex biology and then chemistry going on. But what is more challenging is to think about doing chemistry in laboratory mouse. And at the highest level of complexity to do chemistry in human body. In fact, nowadays, bio-orthogonal chemistry has been tested on human patient to treat cancer. So in order to do reactions in those living organisms, we definitely need new reactions. Bertozzi and her team, um, they developed a new concept called bio-orthogonal chemistry, which described the qualities you will need to do chemistry in living organisms. So they define this bioorthogonal chemistry as reactions which neither interact nor interfere with biological systems. And of course, when um, Carolyn Pertosi heard the discovery of clique chemistry, she was very excited because clique chemistry almost fulfilled the need of bioorthogonal chemistry. However, copper is toxic to the living organism. So then, Bertozzi and her team, they came up with a very clever design to remove copper from the system. So what they did was um, they attached the enzyme. Enzyme, remember we mentioned that one toxin, um, a clique partner, enzyme on the biomolecule. And then they, they switched out signs, the carbon carbon triple bond, in the cyclic structure. So the ring copper catalyst. Okay, so now, as you can imagine, you can attach fluorescent image probe on the biomolecule, and then you can trap them, you can study the biological processes. And also, nowadays, researchers can attach anti-cancer drugs and click and release the anti-cancer drug on the specific position of tumor. I think this is a, a great discovery an application. Um, I wanted to show you a picture that um, made possible by this bioorthogonal chemistry. So this is a picture of um, living cells. And you can see the green glow represent the uh, cell surface glycine, which are kind of um, complex carbohydrates and made of different sugars. They're important biological molecules 
um, as they play important roles in many biological processes, including when cells get infected by virus or when immune system is um, activated. So thanks to clique chemistry, the strain promoted clique chemistry, and the researchers for the first time were able to follow and track this sur cell surface glycine on, on living cells without disturbing the rest of the cell. Okay, so um, from now I'm gonna switch gear a little bit to talk about the um, Nobel laureates. So I'm gonna start from Professor Morton Maldo. Um, instead of reading um, their bios, um, everyone can read, I decided to talk about a little fun fact of each of them. So um, Professor Maldo is currently a professor um, at University of Copenhagen, Denmark. So on October 5th, 2022, um, when he got a phone call saying, congratulations, you got Nobel Prize, um, he didn't believe in it. He thought it was probably one of his students, you know, joking with him, <laughs> because that happened two years ago. <laughs> uh, so he didn't expect it at all. Okay, so the next laureate, Professor Barry Sharpless, okay, that is the one our provost mentioned. That is, this is not the first time for Sharpless to got Nobel Prize. Okay. So he's currently the professor at um, Scripps Research Institution at La Jolla, um, California. He also got Nobel Prize in 2001 because of his contributions in asymmetric um, oxidation reactions. So the fun fact I wanted to talk about um, uh, Sharpless was I had a friend who used to work um, as a graduate student, work for um, not Sharpless, but a professor at Scripps Research Institution. So he told us that um, Sharpless used to ask his students to go to the beach, which is only a few blocks away from Scripps Research Institution, La Jolla, to get ocean water to run the clique reaction to show how robust that reaction is. Guess what? It worked. And then they also run the reactions in um, co coffee and tea and beer, all worked. Okay. Obvious, right? Because they worked in living organisms. Of course it worked in, <laughs> in those solvents, right? Um, okay, so then last but not least, Professor um, Carolyn Pertolzi. Um Professor Carolyn Pertolzi currently is a professor at Stanford University. And the, the fun fact I wanted to mention is, um, when she was an undergraduate student at MIT, I think you know that, right? So she was actually involved in a college rock band. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what role um, she played in the band, but I do know that she plays very good piano. Because I had the honor to listen to her playing piano and sing in person last year. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. And we were asked to talk about the connections um, between the laureates and Hofstra faculty. So I have been thinking about the connections. And I realized there are actually a lot of things we do in common with those uh, laureates. So first of all, we're all chemists. We're very passionate about chemistry. And our students can feel our passion because um, nothing is more contagious than enthusiasm. And when they feel our passion, um, they're motivated to learn more in the classroom. Okay. And second of all, we all teach undergraduate chemistry because all three of them at one point of their life have taught sophomore organic chemistry. And I teach sophomore organic chemistry at Hofstra University. <laughs> I teach Sharpless asymmetric dihydroxylation reactions, Sharpless um, asymmetric epoxidation reactions. In fact, um, when last year's Nobel Prize got announced, I made slides and then I talked about clique reactions and bioorthogonal chemistry. And our students are really inspired, especially when I told them a, a story about Professor Carolyn Pertosi. So what I um, taught to them was, um, Carolyn always talk about this story in a lot of her talks. So when she was an undergraduate student in MIT, she was a pre-med pre-med student. And one day she was sitting in the organic chemistry classroom and then she completely fell in love with organic chemistry. And then she switched major <laughs> to chemistry. 
Um, so I told our students, because we have a lot of pre-med students in my organic chemistry class. So I told them, I said, it's, I understand you wanted to become doctors, which is great. However, you might think of a plan B, right? So being a chemistry can also contribute to biomedical research, can also help patients. And they all got inspired. <laughs> Let's see how many students can, can convert into chemistry major. <laughs> Okay, so the last but not least, um, we all value basic research. I think all of them mentioned in their Nobel lecture, they said without the fundamental basic research, they could not have made those contribu contributions. And they all advocate for the fundings for basic research, especially the curiosity-driven research. That is the type of research we do at Hofstra University with our undergraduate students. And we provide opportunities uh, for authentic research experience for our undergraduate to train them, to prepare them um, to become future scholar, perhaps future Nobel laureates. Okay, so then I wanted to talk my personal connections with Carolyn Perchosi. Um, so I was honored to spend a whole day with her last um, November because um, I was one of the co-organizers for this um, award symposium for creativity in molecular design and synthesis. And last year, the award was given to Professor Carolyn Pertozzi before the announcement of the Nobel Prize. So we did not know she was going to win a Nobel Prize. Of course, we predicted. <laughs> no, we did not. Um, and also, I wanted to mention in 2014, see, this same award was given to Professor David McMillan, who was the Nobel laureate in chemistry in 2021. What a coincidence. <laughs> so now we got to keep this um, tradition going, as because this event was organized um, on behalf of American Chemical Society. So hopefully we can successfully predict the next laureate. We'll see. Um, I mentioned I got to hear Carolyn pl um, play piano, right? So those are the pictures we had with Carolyn. And after the event, we went to a restaurant, Italian restaurant. There was a piano over there. So um, after drinking a cup of um, wine, Carolyn started to play the piano and sing, um, which was an unforgettable day in my life. <laughs> OK, um, that's all for my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. That was excellent. So, so just to add to that, that rock band at, at Harvard that you were mentioning, right? So the, the, the name of the band was Board of Education, B-O-R-E-D. -B and another fun fact, another bandmate was a fellow named Tom Morello who went on to, to found Rage Against the Machine. And so when Carolyn won the prize, there was, Twitter was all a flutter because Tom Morello was congratulating his bandmate for the Nobel Prize. So great, excellent presentations all. So now, on to the last of the evening, which is physics. So uh, it's a pleasure to, um, to welcome Greg Levine, who's a professor of physics and astronomy, to share with us the 22 Physics Prize. So um, last year's Nobel Prize in Physics was um, awarded to um, Aspect, Clauser, and Zeilinger for experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities, and pioneering quantum information science. Um, I really want to start with the last, the last topic and um, um, describe how Quantum mechanics itself is related to information. Actually, it, it sort of it sort of broadens the definition of information. Um, you might imagine quantum mechanics is well suited for information, like bits, zeros, and ones, because it uh, has quantization. And you know, an example is an atom. Um, an atom uh, is only observed in a ground state or an excited state, um, and um, nothing in between. So you might imagine, um, you know, assigning 
uh, a bit to um, you know either of those states, and uh, if nothing else, being able to to make um, information presented on a very microscopic scale because it's atomic. Um, but um, it's actually much better than that. Um, if you take a little bit uh, different example, um, an electron itself uh, has. Um, it behaves like a tiny magnet. It has a uh, north and south pole, and you can imagine an arrow that sort of indicates the, the, um, the, the direction of um, the, um, the magnetization. Um, if you try to build a detector to figure out which way this um, magnet is pointing, so you, you make a detector that um, will exert a force on the electron up uh, to whatever degree the electron is pointing up and down, to whatever degree is pointing down. And so you might imagine, um, you know, like this one, this one you know, these uh, first two on the left there are going to be pushed up a lot. The last one is going to be pushed down a lot. Um, the one maybe in the middle there is not going to be pushed up by very much. But when you actually send them through this detector, um, they all go up or down by exactly the same amount. And this is an example of quantization just like quantization in the atom. Um, but to force the issue, uh, you might try to um, polarize an electron perfectly horizontally and feed it through the same detector. And you'd find that half of the time, exactly half of the time, it would go up, and half of the time it would uh, deflect down. Um, so we, we write this in uh, the sort of strange mathematical notation, side, something polarized to the side is equal to um, up plus down, meaning if you sort of treat the plus sign as an or, a logical or, um, being to the side represents a superposition, a possibility of two different outcomes in an experiment of up or down. Um, and um, if you polarize this electron partly, 30 degrees, let's say, from the horizontal. Um, it uh, goes up three quarters of the time and goes down one quarter of the time. The point here is that it, um, there's quantization on one hand, which says that the arrow can only point up or down. Um, it's a discrete entity. But not all of the aspects of the direction of the arrow are lost. It's sort of the direction of the arrow is encoded in this probability, this exact probability of the outcome of an experiment. Um, so we, armed with that, so now let me try to talk about uh, how to represent information with a quantum mechanical object. So, you know, you might just encode these six bits, these zeros and ones, with your up and down uh, arrows. So, you know, it's up, up, down, up, down, down. Um, but then you could ask, um, what's something like that? What number does that represent? It's six arrows that point horizontally. And if we just follow the strange math, we get something like that. I'm, I'm breaking all the rules of not having, these are equations, but they're weird equations. Um, so it's a product of these, you know, uh, six combinations of up or down. Um, so let me parse just like two of them. You know, imagine you just have two, you're gonna send two of these electrons through your, det your detector. Um, if I uh, just follow the, the you know, algebraic rules for distributing this, I get um, that the possibilities, once I send these through the detector, are that either they, they, they both go up, or one, you know, one goes up and the other goes down. So we have up, up, you know, up and up, or up and down, or down and up, or down and down. Um, and um, in terms of the underlying bits, some kind of superposition of these four different possible outcomes. Um, so for the big product of, of the six, six arrows that point uh, to the right, um, it represents all possible numbers, all possible six-bit numbers, um, 64 of them. And um, the important thing to realize is that if you, you know, if you set these six horizontal arrows through your detector, one of these numbers would be realized, one of them would be measured by the detector. But before you send the six arrows through the detector, it's sitting sort of latently in this state, this superposition of all the possible numbers. And this is one of the keys to um, the huge parallelism in quantum computing, that you can, you can compute um, on 
uh, all the numbers at once. You can compute on all the numbers at one time. So quantum computer preserves this superposition of all of these numbers. It doesn't make measurements. It preserves the superposition so that it can operate on all the numbers at the same time. And that's one of the ways it achieves this uh, parallelism, this you know, uh, rather dramatic parallelism and speed up in some kinds of algorithms. Um, you know, to borrow from the movie title so far, it's everything all at once. Um, but the last piece of um, the speed up of quantum computers was in the Nobel citation. Um, it is the feature of entanglement, which is the, I'm, I'm saying it's the everywhere. Um, and so um, I want to try to explain how, um, or wh what, what entanglement is and um, how it really, um, I think what's amazing to me about it is that it's very much, once you understand what it is in a laboratory, it's very much in conflict with our experience about how the world works. Um, and so I'm trying to give this sort of semi-technical uh, picture of it. Um, so imagine now I have two, two of these horizontal electrons, but one of them is going to, the one that belongs to Alice is going to point to the left, and the one that belongs to Bob is going to point to the right. Um, and we want to send them together. They're going to send them together through this detector. Um, according to the strange algebra previously, it just has this extra minus sign that um, Alice's points one way, Bob's points the other way. There's like no net arrow. It's the arrows cancel. There's no net arrow to begin with. And hence, there's this minus sign in the first product. But the distribution um, of that strange algebraic, uh, the two things in brackets there is the same. There's up and up, or up and down, or down and up, or down and down. Now, so they send their two electrons through the detector. Um, and um, the up, up ones go up, and the down, down ones go down. And you're left with a state that uh, moves through the detector undeflected, which is this, um, it turns out to be an entangled state. And in fact, this process is what we really call distillation, where we're moving these other, these, these up, up, and down, down states. The, um, the entangled state is a, you know, it says that um, Alice is up and Bob is down, or Alice is down and Bob is up. Um, now, you have to remember that these are two, these are still two electrons. There's still two electrons that are owned. One is owned by Alice and one is owned by Bob. And you could imagine very carefully, well, Alice could very carefully take her electron and place it in a non-magnetic box. And Bob could take his electron and place it in a non-magnetic box. Um, and it's sort of hard to picture what's inside those boxes because those arrows are just kind of, I don't know, they're not really, in some deep sense, they're not pointing any direction. They're not pointing at all. Um, but uh, this is a well-defined procedure. Um, so they do this more than once. They send a bunch of pairs through. And um, they carefully put each of their, Alice puts hers in her box, and Bob puts his in his box. They carefully label the boxes. Um, and then um, Bob flies to California with his set of boxes. So um, non-magnetic airplane or something. So flies to, to California. Uh, and they set up their labs there. So they've got their detectors. And um, so uh, the first thing is that if, if Alice, remember that I said that this state of these two opposite spins, that's opposite arrows, that's been distilled into this entangled state doesn't have a direction. There's no, there's no direction to this arrow. And if Alice goes ahead and just starts measuring, let's say she's the first 100 boxes, and she points her de detector in all sorts of different directions as she measures those hundred, the first hundred boxes. She would get completely random results. And remember that the direction of the arrow is subtly encoded by the probability of the outcome of the experiment. So if she gets exactly equal probabilities for all directions, it's telling her that this arrow isn't pointing in any direction in her boxes. I mean, they're all sort of randomly distributed. Uh, Bob would find the same thing measuring, let's say, 100 pristine boxes on his end. Um, but so now um, we sort of take for granted, because these, these two experiments are very far apart, um, we take for granted that you know, an event um, somewhere, um, 
you know, let's say here at Hofstra, an event of some sort can't um, instantly change something far away. That's sort of uh, self-evident. Um, um, it's what we call locality. It's built into some, some parts of physics, actually. But, um, you know, uh, it's this idea that if two things are, are not physically connected, if they're just, you know, there's something here and there's something over there, that doing something over here doesn't instantly change something over there. But I want to show you how Alice can manipulate Bob's electron. So um, she takes her detector and she points it to the star of Taurus. Um, she likes that star. And um, she tells Bob, take out box number 341. She takes out box number 341. Um, and she goes ahead and she measures the arrow. And it points down. Now, she's been measuring random arrows all day, so that's not surprising. It pointed somewhere, it pointed down. But she knows because of this entangled state that if Alice is up, Bob is down. If Alice is down, Bob is up. And so she tells him that, well, take your detector, point it towards Arcturus, and go ahead and measure the arrow. And sure enough, it points up. And he says, well, you know, maybe that's just luck. But they do this many times. Maybe they take a new box. Alice gets up. Bob gets down. Bob could try the same thing. Bob could take a box of his own, try it. If he gets, if he gets down, Alice gets up, and so forth. Um, they move to a different star. They look at um, Ry Rigel. Am I saying it right? Rigel. OK. It's blue. Um, so uh, they look at a different star. Same, same story. Uh, whether Bob does it or Alice does it, if Alice measure, measures an up, Bob measures a down, and vice versa. Um, so it's a, um, you have to first picture that the, um, if an individual measured one of these arrows, they would get a random result. But at the same time, once they measure the arrow, it's kind of locked the outcome of the other measurement. And so it's as if these two arrows are locked to one another at a distance, even though there are no interactions between them. They're not physically connected in any way. They are just um, correlated, but exactly, exactly correlated. Um, you know, I, I spent my time in this talk really describing what entanglement is and not the prize itself because the actual, what was done in the prize, <laughs> um, it's sort of a separate talk. Um, the, the, the long and short of it is that um, the Nobel Prize was awarded for a whole series of uh, kind of works that culminated in um, eliminating all of the loopholes that could lead to a conclusion, an explanation of these experiments that could somehow be local and therefore confirm that quantum mechanics, the law, you know, physical law, is inherently non-local in this way. They, you know, eliminated the loopholes. Um, the loopholes are called hot hidden variable theories, local hidden variable theories. And, you know, it's a fascinating story, but that's like a story for another day. Uh, what those theories are, it's, it began with Einstein and, um, and uh, in uh, really probably the most Im Im important uh, moment was this uh, one physicist, John, uh, John Bell, uh, who proved a theorem about um, the kind of local physics that um, could produce these correlations that, um, that the strength of correlations given by any normal theory, any local theory, had to be weaker than those of quantum mechanics. And so when they say the violation of Bell's theorem was to show that the quantum mechanical correlations indeed prevail. They're stronger than anything local. Um, and uh, so that's really what the, what the prize was, was awarded for. But it, as you can imagine, it's somewhat, you know, somewhat technical. Um, so I wanted to end with, um, entanglement and quantum information in the 21st century, some of it at, at Hofstra. Um, um, I was, what, in the military they call it, um, what do you say, uh, I, was, I was volunteered to give this talk? I don't know, I was volunteered? Because I have, there, there, there's entanglement in my papers and uh, abstract and stuff, so I was the likely target. Um, but many of us actually do work that's connected with entanglement. Entanglement plays a very important role in a lot of condensed matter physics. Um, um, the sort of exotic materials, like the new high-temperature superconductors, these things called topological materials, um, 
uh, these uh, materials called strange metals, which are probably the super, probably the, the precursors to the uh, exotic superconductors, um, where in some deep sense in a strange metal, you know, electrons really just don't behave independently at all. It's like you can't really talk about individual electrons. And then um, in the last 10 years, quantum information made an appearance in quantum gravity. Uh, these are very important developments, um, but um, there were um, a uh, um, there were some developments in string theory that had to do with the relationship between a non gravitational quantum field theory, as it's called, and gravity. Um, and it turned out that those dualities were sort of reflected in a quantum information point of view, having to do with um, entangled states and the kind of network that you would have to create to uh, to create these entangled states. So. I've left with um, the four of us work somewhere. I've tried to put our names somewhere in the proximity of what we what we do. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, and if there are any questions, <laughs> if there are any questions you can express verbally. <laughs> okay. Uh, Great, thanks so much. That was that was wonderful. So I want to thank uh, everyone. I want to thank uh, our six speakers. I want to thank our colleagues and friends at the Cultural Center and uh, Nicole Finocchio from the Provost's Office, who've uh, worked very long hours to help pull this all together, have stayed late in the evening. I want to thank each of you for, for coming. I, I want to, in particular, thank uh, each of our speakers. We have uh, modest gifts for you. They're not Nobel Prizes, but they're, they're, they're Hofstra Prizes, more valuable. Um, to, to recognize uh, your contributions. I really I think this was a tremendous evening. I really enjoyed it. Um, you, you outpaced uh, our very high expectations of sharing with us the, not only the prizes, the people who conduct this work, and really the, the great continuity from literature to economics, peace, medicine or physiology, chemistry, and physics, and I think it's the human experience that ties all of those together in really very profound ways. And it makes me um, feel very blessed and proud to be at an institution um, that we have such wonderful scholars who can talk about these prizes. So I would uh, ask you all to, uh, to join me in thanking the speakers one last time. Um, and I would ask them just to come up briefly for, uh, for the gifts, which uh, are here, and then also we'll do a quick picture of all of them. I believe there's a little bit of coffee and some cookies left and uh, wish you all uh, safe travels home. Thanks. <laughs>